Tales of the Jedi is by far the best Star Wars show released this year. It's better than Book of Boba Fett, it's better than Obi-Wan Kenobi, and it's better than Andor. It is just absolutely magnificent. These are the stories that myself and so many other Star Wars fans have been longing for, and we have to give this series the praise it deserves. Dave Filoni, the showrunner behind the 2008 Clone Wars series, created this and his mark on the show is very clear. This man is a Star Wars god, he can do no wrong, and I think that a big part of that is the fact that he's one of the few who constantly goes back to George Lucas to ask questions. First off, we have to admire how beautiful the show is. The film student in me was in awe of some of the shots they put together. It's not often you talk about cinematography and animation, but Tales of the Jedi nailed this. The way they utilized the focus technique was phenomenal, and it's something we call rack focusing, meaning you pull focus from one object on the screen to another. The very first shot of the show goes from this beautiful town to Ahsoka's father, and it was just the perfect opening shot, something Star Wars is of course famous for, having these cinematic openings. We see this technique be used a ton of other times throughout the show as well, and there's one that's a little bit different than the others that I have to point out. I loved when Ahsoka's mother hit the plan as they beautifully animated all the white puffs, some being more focused than others, and they all perfectly complement the subject of the shot, which was of course Ahsoka and her mother. The first episode was probably the slowest episode, but the most beautiful from a technical standpoint. I loved the shot of Ahsoka and her mother walking up the hill. They keep the camera completely still, or I guess the imaginary camera because this is animation. But slowly we see the main subject of the shot make its way in, almost climbing into the shot which makes for this gorgeous composition. The use of light was incredible as well. In the bar in the second episode, we see light coming in, and the attention to detail is astounding as you can see the dust that the sunlight brings out. There's also other small things like this, like seeing the flies be all over when they walk into the beaten downtown. And going back to the lighting aspect, this whole episode was very dark and they made great use of shadows. I love the scene where Dooku and the woman he's talking to are both in the light while the people behind them are fully shrouded in darkness. My favorite use of shadows and light though had to be when Ahsoka rode the creature into the village. She was hidden in the shadows at first making the villagers fear the creature, but then Ahsoka slowly came into the light and they realized she was no ordinary child, which was so powerful. Ahsoka is Jedi. This show also mixes up shots in an incredible way. You see a lot of close-ups which show the emotion on the character's faces, and then for a second, as the suspense is at an all-time high, they'll cut to this magnificent wide shot that shows the magnitude of each scene. Again and again we see this, and it's not only beautiful, but it lets the audience take in the scope of each landscape. Another thing I noticed was the ending shots for each episode. For all six episodes, the final shot was either a close-up of a character's face or it was a shot of the character's back to the camera. Both techniques leave you with a powerful ending, whether it be because of the emotion on the character's faces or because of the scope the final shot encompasses. And now, let's look at the actual story of this show. This show was interesting because it fills in many gaps from the prequel trilogy, which I absolutely love. Dooku's turn to the dark side was the main gap the series filled in, and it was done masterfully. First off, I love the way they changed Dooku's beard over the course of the three episodes, as he had no beard when he was young, then has one a few years later, and finally right before he turns, he's starting to get white in his hair, which by the time we reach episode 2 will be fully white. Looking at his actual turn, there are so many points that highlight this, and it's a slow progression. His confrontation with the king is what started it all, as the king says he serves the senate, but Dooku says no, he serves the people of the republic. You serve the senate. No, we serve the people of this republic. We then see the moment where he notices the people he just referred to hurting, and with a close up of his face, you can see the emotion where he decides to go dark. The fact that they were able to animate those emotions in such an obvious way is also huge credit to the animators, and even more credit is due when you see the amazing detail of his lightsaber reflecting off his face. Once Dooku goes dark, nothing can stop him, not even his apprentice, as he pushes Qui-Gon back. Between the music, the sound effects, the animation, this scene was so powerful. Dooku then tells the king that his corruption is not acceptable. Corruption like yours must be eradicated. But then, when he snaps out of it, you can again see the emotion on Dooku's face, but this time, it was fear at what he had just done. After it was all said and done, Dooku asks himself if any change will come of this. I want to 
wonder if any meaningful change will come of this. And this is a brilliant line because we as an audience know it does not. Because nothing changes, he will fall to the dark side. At the end of this episode, we see Dooku say the same line to Qui-Gon that Qui-Gon said to Obi-Wan in The Phantom Menace. You're a much wiser man than I, Qui-Gon Jinn. And you're a much wiser man than I am. I just love how much respect this show has for everything that came before it, and I'll continue to point out easter eggs as we go because I think it just really proves how much of a love project this was for Dave Filoni and his team, which I think is a big reason why it's so good. In the next episode, we join Dooku, who was distrusting of the Senate from the get-go. And Senator Larrick's testimony isn't enough for you. It's also fascinating to see him be the complete opposite of a young Mace Windu, which becomes even more important later, as they go down separate paths, and this is perfectly represented at the funeral at the end. The beam of light shines, and in one shot, Dooku is on the right of it, and in the next shot, Windu is on the left of the light, foreshadowing their ultimate destinies on being opposite sides of the light. Seeing Dooku side with the corrupt guards is also very telling, as he agrees with them about the Jedi being lapdogs to the Senate. Jedi claim peace, but mostly keep law and order for the rich and powerful. These words alter not just his distrust for the Senate, but now the Jedi as well. Do you think the Jedi will truly keep peace if they continue to take everything the Senate says as law? Dooku of course came from a very rich family, but he despised his father, meaning he already had disdain for the rich and powerful, and this only reinforces that. This is where he begins to really adopt a separatist philosophy, and it alters his life forever. At the end of the episode, we see him contemplating everything, which leads to one of those final shots I mentioned where his back is to the camera. Episode 4 then fills in the final puzzle piece of Dooku's fall. There's a cool easter egg of Dooku deleting Kamino from the Jedi's database, which of course leads to Obi-Wan not being able to find it in Attack of the Clones. I'm looking for a planetary system called Kamino. It doesn't show up on the archive charts. There's also the mention of Master sifo -Dyas, Master sifo -Dyas. who had a premonition of a great war which led to the formation of the Clone Army. Jedi Master Sifo Diaz is still a leading member of the Jedi Council, is he not? It was also really cool to see how this matched up with Episode 1, as we find out that Qui-Gon had just returned from facing Darth Maul on Tatooine. Your apprentice? Qui-Gon? Yes. It would seem he has encountered a Sith Lord. We also get some insight into the fact that Dooku had been warning the Jedi about the coming darkness, but they never took him seriously. I've been warning them about the coming darkness for years, never to be taken seriously. This point is small, but so important, because it shows that it's almost the Jedi's fault that Dooku resents them and eventually betrays them. Seeing Dooku's reaction to Qui-Gon's death was so powerful as he stands at the great force tree in the Jedi Temple. And again, when they show him contemplating, he has his back to the imaginary camera just as we saw at the end of the last episode. He of course blames the Jedi because they didn't listen to him about the coming darkness, which now took away pretty much the only good thing tying him to the Jedi. The moment where Dooku says Qui-Gon is now with the force and it was time to let him go. Qui-Gon Jinn has become one with the force. It is time to let him go. This has two meanings. It's not just about letting Qui-Gon go, but about moving on from the corrupt Jedi as well. The final part of Dooku's downfall takes place in the same location where Dooku met Sidious in Attack of the Clones, which was a great easter egg. Here, Sidious completes Dooku's turn as he reminds him of all the doubts he had about the Jedi. Remember what you told me. The Jedi blindly serve a corrupt Senate that fails the Republic it represents. And he gives Dooku the order to kill Yaddle. Kill her. Which is almost identical to the order he gave Anakin in Episode 3 to kill Count Dooku. Kill him. Kill him now. Which is very poetic, and also when he gets Anakin to turn on Mace Windu, just as he got Dooku to turn on Yaddle. Yaddle's death was also very powerful, as he slashes her just as Anakin slashed him and cut his head off, and killing her completed his transformation to the dark side. Hearing Sidious tell him to rise gave me chills, and again, it perfectly matches up with Anakin's turn. Rise. Rise. 
This series also focused a ton on Ahsoka. As I said earlier, we followed her when she was just a baby and when everybody discovered she was a Jedi. I loved how they had her control the creature, which was the same power that Anakin used in Episode 2, that Ezra used in Rebels, and that Grogu used to tame the Rancor in the Book of Boba Fett. We then follow Ahsoka much later, and we see Caleb Doom be impressed with her skills, who was of course Kanan Jarrus from Rebels. Later, Anakin trains Ahsoka to be able to fight not only droids, but clones as well, something that would ironically help her fight against the very army Anakin would use on Ahsoka and all the other Jedi during Order 66. If you can hold off Rex and the boys, you'll be ready for anything on the battlefield. It was a really cool detail to see her learn the very moves she would eventually use in the finale of the Clone Wars, which we get a glimpse of at the end of this episode. Let's hope all that training pays off. And speaking of lightsaber moves, I was so impressed with how much detail they put into each Jedi's movements, with not just Ahsoka in the finale, but also Dooku doing his classic move, go down to the right, then up to his face. Seeing Dooku and Mace Windu fight side by side also highlighted how different their lightsaber styles were, and the detail was just magnificent. The final episode houses so many great things. First of all, I love the fact that Ahsoka went to Padme's funeral because, as she said, it was worth the risk because Padme was her friend. She was my friend. We get a bunch of details from the Ahsoka novel as she goes by the name Ashla, the name she took on in the book, and she fights the sixth brother, the main antagonist in the novel. I loved how quick the fight was, almost like the Obi-Wan vs Darth Maul fight in Rebels. And another detail that makes that really cool is that they were both trained by Anakin, but Ahsoka was trained by the Jedi Anakin, while the sixth brother was trained by Darth Vader. And it clearly shows that Anakin's training when he was a Jedi is better than when he was a Sith. After killing the sixth brother, we know from the novel that Ahsoka took the kyber crystals from his lightsaber to make her white lightsabers, which you can see on the cover of the book, and of course in Rebels and the Mandalorian as well. This episode also explores how destructive the Empire is, and this leads Ahsoka back to helping in the fight, which later plays out in Rebels. This show has so many amazing moments throughout, and you can really tell that they had fun making it. They pay tribute to so many different movies, shows, comics, and books that came before it, and it really feels like Star Wars again. The quality of the show and the attention to detail is top notch, and miles ahead of where they started back in 2008 with the first Clone Wars episode. I think that the show is not only in the elite for animated Star Wars shows, but for all Star Wars content. Let me know what you guys thought of this series in the comments below, and hit that like button to help with the algorithm, I would really appreciate it. That's all I have for you in this video though, so I'll see you in the next one. Thank you so much for watching guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. You can follow me on Instagram to see more of my personal life, like my cute dog Loki, and some behind the scenes movie flame stuff. I also do similar content on TikTok and Twitter that I do here on this channel, so if you like what I do here, check them out. All the handles are right below me, and links are in the description. Over here are my wonderful patrons. If you want to be featured on the next video, plus get a few other perks, become a patron today. As always, if you liked the video, hit that like button and subscribe, and look out for more great Movie Flame videos on the way.